Ben Wattenberg. The November elections are just around the corner and it seems the Republicans have the Democrats on the ropes and that challengers have incumbents in a corner. How come? Joining us to sort through the conflict and the consensus are Norman Ornstein, my colleague at the American Enterprise Institute and co-editor of the just released Congress, Press and the Public, Catherine Rudder, Executive Director of the American Political Science Association, Larry Sabato, Professor of Political Science at the University of Virginia and author of the forthcoming book, Corrupt Campaigning, and Eddie Williams, President of the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies, the topic before this house, election 1994, what's at stake this week on Think Tank. Just two years ago, Bill Clinton and the Democratic Congress were riding high. Today, they are very worried. Congress is extremely unpopular, and so is the president. Why? The Republicans point to broken presidential campaign promises and vacillation, as well as to a series of many scandals in the Clinton administration. Democrats blame intense partisanship by obstructionist Republicans for the sour public mood. Whatever the explanation, incumbent politicians of all stripes are running scared, especially congressional Democrats. Today, there are 178 Republicans and 256 Democrats in the House of Representatives. If the Democrats should lose 40 seats, something analysts say is unlikely but possible, then Republicans would be in the majority for the first time since 1952, more than 40 years ago. In the Senate, Republicans need to win seven seats in order to gain a majority. And even if the Democrats lose fewer than 40 seats, the ideological center of the House will almost surely shift somewhat to the right. An incumbent president's party usually does badly in midterm elections, especially when the president is unpopular. And President Clinton is unpopular. Since the beginning of this year, Clinton's approval rating has dropped from 54% to 39% as of mid-September 1994. It is unclear how much of a boost in popularity, if any, he'll get for averting an invasion of Haiti or for how long it may last. But what the Republicans are really counting on is the widespread dissatisfaction with incumbents. Look at this. In a recent poll, only 25% of Americans approve of the way Congress is handling its job while 63% disapprove. At the same time, when voters were asked, have most members of Congress done a good enough job to deserve re-election, or is it time to give new people a chance, 78% of Americans said that it's time to replace Congress with new people. Our first question today, Norm Ornstein, is the mood of this country now to throw the rascals out? The mood is to throw the rascals out generally. Uh, the public anger is real. The trick is to figure out whether on November 8th that anger will be boiling over, which will mean bodies of incumbents littered all over the political battlefield, or just simmering, which will mean elections like 1990 and 92. We get a lot of change, but not the dramatic change. One thing is certain, though, Ben, and that is that we're going to have a lot of uh, the political equivalent of drive-by shootings this time, as happened to Mike Sinar of Oklahoma, a very respected and tough fellow in, uh, uh, who lost in a primary uh, runoff uh, uh, earlier this week. We're going to see more of those. We're going to see surprises. People are going to lash out. Eddie Williams, uh, Norman Ornstein says drive-by shootings. Is that what you see? Is, is there going to be a, a, a big swing here? Are people angry? The, the people are angry and they're very upset. And uh, I suggest that many of the candidates, however, are likely to adjust to the public mood. Therefore, I think the Democrats will lose some seats, but they will not lose control of the House or the Senate. Okay, Larry Sabato. Well, Ben, on average, in a first midterm election of a new presidency, you have 13 or 14 seats lost by the president's party in the House. You have one or two Senate seats lost. I think this year the Republicans will do substantially better than that, perhaps doubling uh, the norm, and that's partly because this year, like some previous midterm years, is becoming a referendum on the incumbent president, and the incumbent president is unpopular. Catherine Rudder. Well, I think the public is certainly angry. 
but I don't think it necessarily plays out in the election. Uh, if you take a look at the number of incumbents who've lost in primaries, why there's been a big surprise, as Norm mentioned specifically in the case of Mike Sinar, um, there are only four, th four, four um, of the incumbents have lost in primaries. So for an angry electorate, it seems to me it doesn't necessarily, it has not so far played out in the way one might have expected. Larry Sabato, you seem to indicate that there was a possibility that this election could be nationalized. I mean, that, that the Republicans could make one central issue or several central issues. I, is that, I mean, you know, Tip O'Neill's famous statement is uh, all politics are local. How do you square that? I think they're both local and national, and we've seen other cases of this. The Democrats did it in 1982, Reagan's first midterm election, when we were in a very serious recession. They were able to make the performance of the national administration on the economy the central issue and pick up 26 seats. So this is hardly unprecedented, but clearly Clinton is the issue in a lot of districts, in a lot of states. That doesn't mean that the incumbents won't be able to get around it. Many of them will. They're very agile politicians. They wouldn't be in Congress if they weren't. You know, Ben, the, biggest, the single biggest national effect that you get in a midterm election is people who are angry tend to turn out. People who are uh, not happy but uh, uh, basically uh, uh, conflicted Democrats are, may well sit uh, this one out and stay home. But there are a couple of things to remember that mitigate against a kind of dramatic partisan switch in the House. In 1982, as Larry mentioned, the pendulum swung back after a big swing in the previous election. In 1980, Republicans picked up 33 seats in the House with the Reagan landslide. They lost back 26 of those the next time. The pendulum didn't swing in 1992. Democrats actually lost 10 seats when Bill Clinton got elected. So that'll probably limit some of the losses. And then money matters. There's so many seats that are really contested now, ironically, that the ability for any challenger to raise enough money to run an effective contest in the House uh, is limited. And I don't think you should, we should underestimate the capacity of incumbents to change their political spots. Uh, and I think we'll see a lot of shifting and toing and froing, confu further confusing the electorate in terms of what people stand for. I think that is part of the reason for some of the cynicism that many of the voters see in politicians, that they constantly shift all over the place to play to special circumstances. Two of the four incumbents who lost were members of the Congressional Black Caucus, and I think in each of those cases there were some special considerations uh, involved in their, in their jurisdictions. Incidentally, since I went on, on the limb with a prediction before, I predict that there will be a very modest increase in the size of the Congressional Black Caucus this fall. Ben, both Norm and Kathy have mentioned a very important case, though, and that's Mike Sinar. Very able, very senior a congressman who clearly was more liberal than his district, but still had strong support in a district that's pretty heavily Democratic. To have a, a congressman, an incumbent like Sinar, defeated by a 71-year-old retired person with no history of public office, suggests to me that we may have more upsets on November 8th than we're currently calculating. On the point of a national issue, it seems to me that the outcome of what is happening in Haiti may very well play, uh, uh, loom very large in terms of the uh, November elections. Yeah, and we don't, what, we don't what, see fully the outcome at maybe, this point. Maybe, uh, maybe you can tell me what is happening. What time is it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, is Haiti going to be a plus for the president? If things go well uh, for him, right now they are going well. Uh, it seems to me he's gotten a, a slight bump up on that particular issue. And uh, if, if, uh, if matters continue and there's a limited amount of bloodshed or no bloodshed at all, I think that is a plus. If he gets Cedrus out of there, uh, either out of, out of the office by October 15th, perhaps even out of the country, I think that is a plus. With Aristide going back and taking over, I think that is a plus. He will indicate be an indication of his ability to use uh, diplomatic means. I, I would take another view. I would have to disagree with my distinguished colleague because I, I think at best he can get a wash out of this and that is if everything goes beautifully and American troops aren't killed and, and the plan unfolds as the agreement suggested that it would and so on. Uh, the problem here is, is really twofold. First, the American public by and large thinks that this Haiti intervention is somewhere between stupid and insane. And over time, as things happen, as they inevitably do, whether it's troops being killed or whether it's the plan not working as projected, uh, I think it's going to hurt. I really think it's going to hurt Clinton. Uh, so we'll have to see what happens, but the Democrats dodged a bullet in not having an invasion with lots of casualties, but this could still turn very, very sour for the incumbent party. 
you know, this, this shows why it's so tricky to try and make projections of how many seats will be gained and lost. Events between now and November the 8th, what Congress does in the next few weeks in terms of dealing with an agenda that includes GATT and health care reform and uh, uh, telecommunications reform and a whole series of other things is going to matter. If they flop and look terrible, it'll uh, fuel public anger. It'll be like throwing gasoline in the flames. If Haiti has some disaster, it'll make a real difference. And the timing of it makes a difference, too. Would you advise Democratic congressional candidates to put some distance between themselves and their own president, which is what the president's own pollster, Stan Greenberg, said is perfectly all right. Is that a wise strategy, Catherine? Uh, certainly in the South it is. Um, it, it's, it's clear that Clinton is not popular in the South, and if you take a look at where the Republicans have the best chance of picking up seats, in the House in particular, um, it's to the South. In fact, half the strategy has to be there, at least, I believe. Um, and it's, there's nothing wrong with dis for these members to distance themselves from President Clinton. Many of them have not supported President Clinton down the line, especially in the South. So it's a wise strategy. It's just what they should do, and it's not dishonest. I, I don't want to be a total contrarian because I Go basically right agree with what Kathy <laughs> said. But, you know, there's another argument to be made that goes back to a point Norm made about turnout. Uh, if, you, if you embrace your president and you embrace your party's principles and you go full speed ahead in, in terms of what your party stands for, you might energize your base. And that really is what the Democrats' basic problem is this year, other than Clinton's unpopularity, energizing that base. But, Larry, I don't believe in non-minority districts. In the South, you can energize a South. base for, for President Clinton. I agree with that in the South. It's simply but outside a fact. The South, the South has undergone a transformation anyway, a partisan transformation, and I believe it's just continuing to the degree parties matter at all anyway. One of the things <laughs> that works against that in some southern states, of course, is the very large block of black voters that you have that tend to vote overwhelmingly, uh, overwhelmingly Democratic. I did say non-minority. Uh, uh, Eddie, are, are we looking at a further polarization of American politics and American life? That, wh that whites are going to vote one way and blacks are going to vote another way? I I is that what we're going to continue to see in America? Well, I, don't, I don't consider it polarization any more than it has been in the past. People vote their interests. And in good conscience, blacks tend not to see Republican candidates who represent their interests until I put the onus on the, on the candidate and on the Republican Party, until they put up candidates that blacks in good conscience can support, yes. Now, clearly, you've got a lot of differences in the South, and the redistricting exacerbates uh, those racial differences. And they are going to be very substantial changes in the South. One of the things that that's going to do, though, is uh, it's going to change the character of the Democratic Party in the next, the 104th Congress. Because basically the Democrats at risk and the Democratic seats at risk are in the South, as Kathy said, and in the West. They also tend to be the more conservative Democrats who are the ones at risk. And what that means is that the old conservative coalition, which relied in the Reagan years on 40 or 45 uh, so-called mainstream Democrats, isn't going to have that many around. There may be 15 or 20, and so the net shift in conservative terms is not going to be as great as people expect if Republicans pick up 20, no, 25. No, <coughs> Norman, you were right. talking about uh, turnout before, and we are reading uh, lots of stories about the power of the Christian right, the Christian coalition, and mm -hmm. bringing their members out, certainly in primaries. I, I, is, there, uh, is that going to change the dynamic if the Democrats disheartened are not going to turn out That's and the Christian right is going to turn out? Uh, it, there's no question it makes a big difference. And when we look at the almost inexorable patterns in American <coughs> politics, that the president's party loses seats in the House in the midterm elections, I think this, uh, one of the key dynamics is that almost invariably, supporters of a president coming in have expectations that are very high, and they're never met. They're always uh, somewhat disheartened. And people on the other side get very uh, upset by what's going on. and have a much greater zeal and ability to mobilize and get their voters out. And the question of whether you can get your voters out in an election, remember, where turnout drops about 15 points from a presidential election year, becomes critical. And you could look at Larry's uh, state of Virginia in the Senate race, where you know we, we, we take the conventional wisdom that Oliver North has a, a ceiling of about 35 percent of the voting population in terms of support. But if the, uh, he gets his voters out, and that means mm -hmm. the Christian coalition people who are organizing and pushing and voter registration drives, and the rest of the voters are disheartened and don't turn out L as much, Larry, that may there, be enough there to was win. a poll no. this morning that I saw after Doug Wilder dropped out that instead of that, uh, we assume mostly black vote, 
uh, going to Chuck Robb that it uh, apparently split and uh, some of it went to Oliver North and he is now ahead. I mean, you have a wild race there. What, what, what do you make of that? And well, there, there are two factors at work. One, Norm has just mentioned. The fact is that uh, Christian coalition and uh, voters on the right and the Republican Party generally are energized and they are apparently going to turn out in disproportionate numbers. The Democratic coalition is somewhat disorganized because of the split in the party and that's hurting. But it's also true that it's too early to say for sure Wilder just dropped out. Rob hasn't had an opportunity yet to consolidate Who do you think those Wilder win? voters. Who do you think If win? the election were held today, it would be North, but it's not by an enormous margin right now. It's relatively close, and I think Rob still has an opportunity to close that gap. I'd like to bring out two things. One, to reiterate something Norm said, uh, and that is you pointed out that, in fact, in the 1992 election, that was not a great pull for the Democrats or for Clinton, and we might reiterate that Clinton only got 42% of the popular vote. That's going to affect... Um, what happens in 1994, there'll be less of the surge and decline effect that yeah. you were talking about. Um, so, uh, so, so, so you think some of these predictions of democratic uh, apocalypse are overstated? I'd say they're overstated, that's would, all. Would, would Just, you, that's would, not would, to say would, the Democrats won't lose substantial number of seats. I believe they will, and I how, think they're going to lose a lot in the House. Substan I mean in the substantial, South. give me a range. I'd say uh, 25 is not unreasonable in the House. And how many in the Senate? Mm, I'd say five are not unreasonable in the Senate. Um, but wait, I want to point one other thing out before we go on um, with, regard to, um, with regard to these elections and the Christian coalition specifically. They do best in primaries. Uh, any group that's uh, somewhat fringe does best in primaries. They energize their folks, they get them out, um, and they can change elections. But, but so it, it isn't in a general election, it, it, these candidates must go toward the center or they're simply not going to win in most cases, even with great organization by the Christian coalition. But, but, it, but, but, but it's suppose, suicide but to suppose stay to the, the right or suppose, to the left. Suppose the public uh, is, is being galvanized not by the Christian coalition, but what you might call a values coalition. So the Christian coalition may be the cutting edge of it, but isn't there a, a, a feeling that, that, it, it, that, we, that there's something wrong with our value system in government, out of government? You see that in poll. I know that Times Mirror poll shows that just again and again and again. Sure, you but see it in the black community. Yeah, but Ben, it doesn't mean then that people are going to turn around and vote for strong right candidates. It simply doesn't. I mean, there's the Achilles heel yeah. of abortion, if nothing else, for most women. Um, and a lot of other moderates, that alone. But so you can be, one can be quite worried about values, and I think uh, we discussed this mm -hmm. before the show began, liberals and conservatives both are concerned about values and, the, and where the country's going, but that does not then translate into a vote for a right-wing candidate. Uh, that is, you know, one point about the black community, <laughs> at least you see in the Times Mirror surveys, and I think Eddie sees it in his surveys too, uh, the whole notion of an evangelical movement. There's a very substantial evangelical component in the black community. Yes. On many of the social issues, including abortion even, the black right. community is mixed and there's concern about the moral fabric of the society in both places. But what we see in the Times Mirror survey is that it, it's not of particular benefit really to either party. Right. In fact, the Republican Party has a huge and growing split between those we call enterprisers, whose main concern is the kind of traditional economic one and business-oriented one, and those we call moralists, who've almost doubled in number and who are anti-business and whose major concern is moral deterioration. There's a real give and take there. What's happened is both parties have lost support and the concern about morals and values has extended to a concern about institutions, which is hurting the Congress as a whole. This time, Republicans will reap the benefits, right. but believe me, they may reap the whirlwind if they're not careful. Right, uh, listen, well Catherine was, was, was brave enough to give a, uh, a fairly specific uh, prediction. I would like to just go around the room to the rest of you uh, and ask for, for your predictions, and then I want to go on to one other major topic. She, she said about 25 lo uh, seat loss in the House and five in With the most of it in the South. With most of it in the South. So let, in the let's South. just real quick, just we numbers. We do this. It's a moving target. I'd say Norman. it may be around 20 in the House and four or five in the Senate. I'll buy that. Somewhere in the 20s in the House, uh, three to five in the Senate, uh, but he who lives by the crystal ball ends up eating ground glass. There you go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> now. Ben's eating a lot of ground glass. <laughs> oh, yeah. Not as much as, not as much as some people. Not as much as some people. Uh, <laughs> Let us assume that this range of predictions is correct, and this means a substantial loss for the Democrats. What would the effect on the Clinton agenda be if such a change happens? Well, 
Go ahead. I was going to say one, one thing's for sure. If the Republicans gained enough seats to actually take control of one house, it would be a godsend for Bill Clinton. In politics today, unfortunately, you need a devil figure to run against. And just as Harry Truman ran against a do-nothing Republican Congress, Bill Clinton would get the opportunity to run against a gridlocking Republican senator, whatever the case may be. So you can win by losing and lose by winning, and uh, Republicans, I think, had better hope they don't gain control of either House of Congress. Well, I think there's that prospect. But also there's the prospect of the reemergence of the new Democrat Bill Clinton, who would indeed try to reach out to establish some greater rapport with uh, with moderate Republicans, which is what he's been accused of not doing in the crime bill fight. I don't think that the um, Republican leadership has gotten proper credit for what they've done in the last couple of years. The movement from sort of the Bob Michael approach of cooperation, still partisanship, but cooperation and gentlemanliness, to the Newt Gingrich approach of um, fierce opposition. Um, uh, has had quite an impact, I think, on, on the Democratic Party and on Clinton's success and his lack of success specifically. Um, and um, I think if the Republicans continue, the Republican leadership, Dole and Gingrich specifically, continue this uh, very fierce partisanship, which is matched, I would say, in equal part on the Democratic side. But if they continue that, it seems to me that we will see a very difficult next two years and more public disaffection with Congress in general. Eddie, uh, is it possible that people like myself who say he has been running the government too far to the left may be pleased because he will, instead of building this coalition, uh, Democrats only, that he will be forced to go to a centrist co coalition? Well, you may be pleased if you're a victim of the Clinton charm. and. Uh, of his ability to <laughs> articulate his points of view. Otherwise, I doubt if you're going to be pleased at all. But I do think that he has the ability to, to shape issues uh, on welfare reform. Uh, blacks are not totally happy with how he has articulated his support for welfare reform. They're not totally happy with where he's come out in terms of, of some of the health issues. He has got to learn to play to his strength, which is bridging issues and reaching constituencies. Isn't there a fly in the ointment here, though? And, and Norm alluded to it earlier. If you have uh, many of these uh, conservative or moderate conservative Democrats in the South and border states going down this year, that means the Democratic caucus will be more liberal in the next Congress. And won't they be pushing Clinton in another direction? Uh, what Clinton has to hope for, first of all, is that the Democratic caucus, which will be more liberal, instead of pushing him in that direction is chastened enough by lo a loss of seats to recognize that they've got to move to the middle. And the power brokers, I will predict, in the next Congress, are not going to be the old bull weevils who, of course, Reagan courted all the time. It's going to be the so-called gypsy moths. It's going to be the 30 or 35 Republicans in the House who are willing to talk, uh, a model being the crime bill in the end. If he can get the Mike Castles of Delaware and the David Dryers of California and the Nancy Johnsons of Connecticut and the Ralph Regulars of Ohio and the Fred Uptons of Michigan, there are 30 or 35 of them, and get them in the room with him, then Newt Gingrich's incredible ability to keep his own coalition together may not be there. But that requires Clinton to start in the center, as you said, and to withstand the pressure at both extremes. If he can do that, I think he could have a very uh, productive two years, and the public would look more favorably upon him. If he's pulled in one direction or he tries to have it every which way, then he's going to be in deep, deep trouble. And it seems to me what Norm suggests, which is, I think, the pro politically correct st strategy, is almost like threading the eye of a needle right. to get but those 30 we, we people are, in the room we, we and are, get them to We are to out of time. Bolt. I just would like to do one thing very quickly. Give me a pick in the uh, upcoming Senate races that will be a surprise to voters on election night. Tennessee, two seats up, one incumbent, Jim Sasser, running against a newcomer, uh, Bill Frist, uh, a real race to watch. Missouri, Alan Wheat winning the Senate uh, seat to become the second black Democrat in the United States Senate. In Montana, Democrat Jack Mudd has a real chance to upset incumbent Republican Conrad Burns, and that could make it difficult for Republicans to take over the Senate. In Virginia, Chuck Robb holds on to his Senate seat, Democrat. Okay, thank you, Norman Ornstein, Catherine Rudder, Eddie Williams, and Larry Sabato. And thank you. As you know, we have enjoyed hearing from you very much. Please write with any questions or comments to the address on the screen. Or Think Tank. I'm Ben Wattenberg.
This has been a production of BJW Incorporated in association with New River Media, which are solely responsible for its content.